Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Sharad Jaitley, cardiologist from New York, your cardiologist on your favorite website, munimeterhealth.com, which is a site which is dedicated to educate you about the human heart and its illnesses, and the mission has been to keep you healthy. Also, the mission has been to combine the medical education to, with the patient education to achieve the highest clinical outcomes. That's how I personally feel at moneymeterhealth.com. Thank you for watching, learning, and sharing with your loved ones, your colleagues, your interns, your students, your residents, your fellows, and of course, uh, my dear cardiologists and the general community at large. Without any further ado, I'd like to delve into the subject matter. As always, I like to discuss uh, short video vignettes on uh, certain uh, cardiac clinical conditions. Um, what is Epstein's anomaly? And that is, we know, is uh, named after, obviously, uh, somebody who actually pioneered in defining uh, Epstein's uh, anomaly, and that's Dr. Epstein, obviously, we pay the tributes to the person, uh, the huge physician who actually defined what the congenital anomaly the child is born with. Now, what is interesting about Epstein's anomaly is it comes in very severe forms, in moderate forms, in milder forms, and in almost asymptomatic forms as in adult lives. Uh, obviously, if it's a very, very severe and extreme form, then one does not uh, uh, recognize it, uh, you know, um, at a later age, but it has to be recognized rather early in order to benefit. So let's understand what the, what the, what the congenital uh, defect is without any further ado. Well, I'm going to draw my schematic here of the heart, if you will, and let's use uh, this red color instead. Okay. Here we go. And this is the, say, the right side of the heart. And here we are showing the left side of the heart. So the concentration is mostly on the right side. So the definition of abstinence anomaly is apical, which is here, apical displacement of septal tricuspid leaflet. Remember, the tricuspid leaflets are three of them, one here, another one here, and another one here. So it is this apical displacement that occurs towards this end of the heart of this septal leaflet that is causing the atrialization of the right ventricle, if you will. So what is happening? This guy moves here, if you will. And therefore, this septal is sitting here in this region. So the entire atrium is now almost in this fashion like this. So it's called the atrialization of the right ventricle. Because the right ventricle is almost rudimentary. The entire heart is cons consistent with right atrium. Now remember, you can also have a mural, which is your mural is uh, this one here. The mural also can get displaced. But the anterior leaflet never gets displaced. Remember that. Now, there is an infundibular dilatation that occurs, so that is contributory as well, so the infundibular dilatation. Now, if you were to do an x-ray on this individual, here is an x-ray, we're drawing the lungs on either side, and the chest x-ray will be showing almost like a bottle, uh, it's like a water bottle. Why? Because the right atrium moves out here, this is your right atrium. The right ventricle has its own convexity, so that's your RV, and this is in this fashion, so... You see that? And the left ventricle is also dilated because of the infundibular dilatation. So you have the left leftward convexity as a result. So it's almost, uh, it has been defined as a water bottle appearance. The heart has a water bottle appearance. Okay. Uh, water. Let me write the water here. Okay. So water, uh, the bottle of water, kind of uh, the good old fashioned, uh, I don't know whether you remember that or not, but this is how the water bottle looked like. If you, if you, if I, as, as a child, I used to carry a water bottle to my school in those years. And now, of course, we all have these thermos flasks. But just so that you know, that this is the wall. So, uh, but that's on a chest x-ray. Now, echo is diagnostic, obviously. Why? Because you can actually see the septal movement. As I said, the septal has been, the septal tricuspid valve has been, displaced to the apical value. Now, there is a cutoff here. Remember, just like for mitral valve prolapse, you have to have definition. So here it is almost uh, uh, 88 
millimeters, if you will, per meter square based on the body surface area. 88 millimeters per square is the displacement of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And that, by definition, is Epstein's anomaly on an echo. What does an EKG show, if you'd like to see now? An EKG will, well, besides, uh, now besides this displacement on the echo, let's complete that, it'll also show the right to left shunt. Why? Because the chances are this patent foramen ovale here will stay uh, uh, open in some respects, and that's, that becomes the PFO here, which is commonly associated, or even there might be an AST. And therefore, there is a shunt. Now, if the shunt is traveling in this direction, it's called the right-to-left shunt. So there will be a right-to-left shunt, if you will, and there will be, of course, a PFO. So PFO or NAST. So these are the features of Epstein's anomaly. What is it? 88 millimeters per meter square of your septal tricuspid leaflet displacement, a PFO and AST associated with it, and obviously a right-to-left shunt. The, the shunt magnitude is dependent upon the size and, of course, the pressures in the right ventricle. Invariably, the right ventricle pressures are higher because of the right ventricle hypertrophy that sets in, and then the huge TR will be present, obviously, so there's a tricuspid regurgitation as well and pulmonary hypertension. So these, uh, these patients have to be operated rather quickly, and the more the hypertension, more the pulmonary hypertension, more the regurgitation, more the shunt, the, the severity of the Epstein's anomaly goes along with that, and therefore they need uh, surgical attention. ECG, well, it's very important to recognize the good old-fashioned test called ECG. And why is ECG is important? Well, one, you'll see a, P, uh, a tall P, P waves. So there are tall P waves existing, and these are very, very tall, and especially in lead two and V1. Remember that, tall P waves, if somebody shows that, that's this thing. You'll have a PR prolongation, which is the rule, but you can also have, so PR is prolonged, uh, but normally, um, um, uh, if the PR is normal, then obviously you start wondering whether there was an accessory pathway. So there might be an accessory pathway which is also existing in this fashion. And the accessory pathway will make the PR shorter. So remember that. PR gets shorter and then there will be a delta wave. And what does that mean? That becomes WPW, obviously. So that is the, that is this, uh, that is the sine qua non of WPW, short PR, delta waves. QRS prolongation, that makes it WPW. So the ECG has, uh, again, very beautiful criteria, if you will. One, in good old-fashioned ways where we did not have the echo, now we have the echo, but in good old days when we did not have the echo, ECG and the water bottle on the chest X-ray were the diagnostic features, and I'll tell you what the clinical looks like. So tall P waves in lead 2 and V1, a short, uh, prolonged PR in general, first degree AV block, if you will, but if there's an accessory pathway that exists, there will be a short PR and a delta wave existing also. Now, let's move on to the next part, which is the clinical features. And what are the clinical features? Well, first of all, the patient will be markedly dyspneic, so there'll be a dyspnea on exertion, if you will. There'll be fatigue, obviously, the patient will have exertional fatigue and uh, failure to thrive because it's growing, uh, the child is growing up at a at a very, very slower pace than the, than the other counterparts, which are normal. So these are some of the features. Uh, dizziness, fatigue, and uh, very rarely syncope, and of course, but shortness of breath is very, very important because of the pulmonary hypertension that sets in. Uh, right to left shunt can also contribute to uh, further cyanosis. Paradoxical embolism, very important. Why? Because paradoxical, this may be the only feature that they may suggest, say, in a 20-year-old or a 19-year-old who is having a TIA or a stroke, if you will. And somebody who's having a TIA or a stroke, remember, that gives you a clue that there's a right-to-left shunt, a paradoxical embolism has occurred, and, uh, and, uh, and the embolus has traveled through the PFO or the AST that's also coexistent with that tricuspidatory, uh, you know, with, that, uh, with Epstein's anomaly. Now, um, clinically, obviously, you're going to hear uh, the, the TR murmur will be present, and uh, there will be, uh, um, the, the first sound will have a sail sound, if you will, the first sound, and then there will be, uh, um, the, the, so it is, it is wide, wide and uh, split, if you will, wide and split. The second sound is also wide and split because there might be a right bundle present. Um, so these are a few of these features that one sees, but the tricuspid regurgitation is the commonest uh, that one sees. And uh, the treatment plan is obviously uh, surgical uh, repair. Uh, mostly it is management of heart failure, and um, um, essentially that's where we are with this. 
So uh, in a nutshell, you, what you have learned about uh, Epstein's anomaly is that uh, it is a congenital anomaly which is present uh, where the septal uh, leaflet or the tricuspid valve is displaced apically to a level of 88 millimeters per meter square, uh, defining a tricuspid regurgitation along with that and sometimes uh, coexistent PA4 or ASD. A chest x-ray will define a white uh, water bottle pattern and the EKG will show a tall P wave with a sometimes a WPW pattern existing, otherwise the PR prolongation exists. Um, there will be, of course, on the chest x-ray, you will also see a lack of uh, pulmonary vasculature or maybe normal vasculature, but definitely not high, uh, high amount of uh, 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 you know, uh, vasculature seen. And uh, dyspnea and fatigue and shortness of breath, they are the common presenting features, but do not forget per paradoxical embolism. Well, thank you for your attention on moneymeterhealth.com. This was a very, very short presentation on Epstein's anomaly. Hope you find it interesting and uh, be sure now when you take the boards, uh, um, just to watch this one first uh, before uh, you go and take the exam and good luck. Thanks again and thank you for watching moneymeterhealth.com. This is Dr. Jaitley. Arios.